I turned over a bright metal shell that rippled when She I... says human longing for mystery leads to a commonality of belief in immortality. Dad's late or I'm early. Either way, I have time to scout the pens. Can't Redemption and claustrophobia, what artists understand. Not valuing... Uh, I've lived in Nebraska for 10 years now. Uh, I'm originally from the West Coast. I was born in Tacoma, lived there for a lot of years, uh, and then lived in Seattle, uh, lived overseas. I lived in Malaysia for three years total, two years in the Peace Corps, one year in the UN. Uh, I lived in the Philippines for a year in the UN. I lived in Burundi, Africa for a year teaching English, uh, and in Pennsylvania. So I've been all around, uh, but I've been here, as I said, 10 years now and uh, I'm teaching English uh, in the English department at uh, UNL. I think what inspires me to write is, is it's based on my experiences overseas, um, where the first world meets the third world, and it seemed to me that uh, there's a lot of psychological uh, projections and displacements that take place when uh, people from different cultures mingle with, with each other and they come to this sort of contact zone. Uh, and I'm really interested in what happens to people when uh, they, they form bonds between, or with people in, in different cultures. I think the people that have been most influential so far, first have been my teachers at, at UNL. Uh, I was a, a PhD graduate student here for many years. Uh, I took great courses with, uh, with Marley Swick and uh, Jerry Shapiro and Judy Slater. Uh, they were very influential in, you know, in, in teaching me and being very supportive. Uh, uh, but also, uh, some of the authors I've read have been very influential. Uh, Paul Theroux is one of my favorites, uh, as is Anthony Burgess. And Burgess, in particular, wrote a book called The Malayan Trilogy that no one reads these days. But that was very influential for me in writing the novel that took place in Malaysia. I guess I try to be fairly universal in my voice in that I try to get into uh, various characters' heads. And all these characters have different ways of looking at the world. So I try to have the voice um, somehow match the character. And some of them are, are, are lovely people, others are very brutal, some are very you know, short and snappy, others are kind of lyrical and so on. Uh, so it, it's really tough for me to talk about one particular writing style. Though I, I do like to inject a lot of humor into the writing as well as a lot of seriousness. One thing I try to do in my writing is to, to talk about those, those contact zones between the, the first world and in the third world, and just how difficult uh, human relations are when you have people from different cultures combining. And sometimes they clash, sometimes they mingle. Um, but it does seem to me that there's a lot of distortions of normal, everyday uh, human interaction that occurs. So I, those are the questions that I, I try to examine. For someone starting out, um, I think the best advice I'd, I'd have for them is first find something that you care about deeply, something that you love, something that you hate, something that evokes very strong emotions in you. Um, and once you find what that is, and it's probably going to be something that you don't know the answer to. It's going to be a question that, that, that lingers in your mind that you keep returning to. Uh, and maybe you find that the answers you've come up with have, are, are unsatisfactory, or maybe they keep changing. Uh, but once you find that, then you probably find what your literary landscape is. Um, and then once you do that, I think taking a class is, is the best thing you can possibly do. because That puts you in, in a real community of writers. And you'll find that everyone is very dedicated to it and they're very supportive. Um, and <clears throat> you, you, you come away with, with, with um, uh, much more than, than, than you brought in. Uh, well, I hope to continue uh, writing novels, but also short stories. I have a short fiction collection that I've been shopping around, and uh, I want, I'd like to get that published. Uh, I'd also like to do some writing about things that take place in the U.S., but I'm not quite sure what the subject matter is going to be. It seems to me clear the sort of themes that I'm interested in that take place overseas. Good evening. My name is Susan Herrick, and I would like to welcome you to the Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors in the 118th program of the John H. Ames Reading Series. 
The Heritage Room is a special collection dedicated to preserving and promoting works by and about Nebraska authors. Currently, the collection has over 11,000 volumes written by more than 3,000 authors. In an effort to promote these authors, the Heritage Room, along with the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association, sponsors the Ames Reading Series to bring the authors and the audience together in a local setting. I would particularly like to thank the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association because it is through an endowment established through their efforts that we are able to bring you programs like these. We are truly grateful to them. I welcome and encourage all of you to visit our collection during the regular public service hours so you can experience the treasures and resources Nebraska authors can provide. Born in East St. Louis, Paul Eggers came to Nebraska and received his Ph.D. at UNL and currently teaches English there. He has many short stories published in journals including Northwest Review, Quarterly West, and Sonora Review. His creative nonfiction is in Colorado Review and Southern Humanities Review. His novel Saviors has brought him a lot of, a lot of recognition. He received the James Fellowship for the Novel in Progress and the Nebraska Arts Council Merit Fellowship in Fiction while writing Saviors. Mr. Eggers was a Peace Corps volunteer in Malaysia from 1976 to 1978 and a UN relief worker in Malaysia and the Philippines from 1980 to 1982. He is a former chess master and wrote interviews, profiles, and political analysis analysis for Inside Chess magazine. He lives here in Lincoln with his wife Ellen. Paul Eggers. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of short sections from uh, my novel Saviors. Uh, the novel examines the lives of three main characters. There are two American relief workers, one male and one female, and a Malaysian, an Indian Sikh Malaysian bureaucrat. Um, all three characters uh, work in a Malaysian refugee camp for Vietnamese boat people uh, during the late 70s and early 80s. In the first section, <coughs> I'm going to read, uh, this is the introduction of the main female character, an American uh, relief worker named a nickname pork pie. Uh, she's just arrived in Malaysia. She drove up from Singapore on the overnight bus and now she's in the city of Kuala Tringanu, which is the jumping off point for the refugee camp on Badong Island. And she just had a very unpleasant encounter with one of the uh, other relief workers uh, named Manley, whose name also comes up in the chapter. <coughs> and there's also a uh, a Chinese character introduced. Uh, his name is Cowboy Lim. He's a, an important secondary character. Cowboy Lim, owner of Cowboy Lim's Rest House off Bungaraya Road, knew a quotation from Jean-Paul Sartre, hell is other people. He knew it primarily because his establishment attracted a white clientele, mostly Australian backpackers. From the second floor, the backpackers on the street side looked out over the marquee of the Lido Cinema for a spectacular view of the waterfront in the South China Sea. From the alleyway side, they leaned over the railing and took pictures of hawkers squatting in the dirt, stirring walks full of boiling oil and spattering bananas. As much as the view, the price made the backpackers wink with satisfaction. At nine ring at per night, 12 with aircon, the rest house was much cheaper than the four-story Hotel Kuala Tringanu and each room had a plastic line stretching from door to window for guests who wished to wash and hang their laundry. The price appealed to their sense of privation, the view to their sense of entitlement. The two were forever in conflict. White people could be unpleasantly contradictory, and they made innkeeping difficult. They were more infuriating than his own wife, and Mrs. Lim could make him so mad with her sharp tongue that he went for long walks almost every night to think of ways to silence her. Sometimes the white people said they liked his cowboy hat, but then they leaned close and winked and said, hey, mate, but you don't wear it all the time, do you? As if you couldn't be Chinese and wear American cowboy hats. As if, because you were Chinese, you had to harbor seething grudges against the Malay-run government and join so many secret societies you didn't have time to brush your hat. The white people wanted their Chinese to act Chinese. They wanted him to work like a dog, but they also wanted him to utter expansive truths. 
In fact, working like a dog brought you much closer to thinking like a dog than speaking like a philosopher. So the equation was much more complicated than the white people suspected. He was neither dog nor philosopher. He was Cowboy Lynn, and he wore a cowboy hat, and he spent his evenings bickering with Mrs. Lim and drinking Remy Martin VSOP with Reuben Gill. If people didn't like it, that was fine with him. His nephew, Yap, agreed. White bastards, La, he said, folding waxy towels piled atop a check-in desk. Nephew Yap had his own complaints. On weekends, he was a waiter on the roof garden of the Hotel Kuala Tringanu, where the white relief workers from Badong Island stayed on leave. In some ways, they were even worse than the backpackers. They said Badong was in their blood, but according to Reuben Gill, who was one of the main characters, they thought they had a better chance of getting laid by tourists if they advertised themselves as humanitarians. Perhaps Reuben Gill was right. If Badong truly was in their blood, then they wouldn't spend 50 ring and a night to stay in the Hotel Kuala Tringano, which had tablecloths and central air. They sat drinking on the roof garden of the hotel, leaning back in their chairs and telling people they worked with refugees. Sometimes they stared into the ocean. At certain times of day, they said, if atmospheric conditions were ideal, one could sit on the hotel's roof and see a little smudge in the water, way off to the northeast. That smudge, they said, was Badong Island. They were apparently the only ones who could see it. Whenever Nephew Yap or the Malay waiters squinted from the railing, they just got headaches. You can't see it, the white people would crow. Is that wish fulfillment talking or you? There it is, right there. Bidong has more Vietnamese than this country has ever seen, hey? Isn't that right? So it was, with calculated gruffness, that Cowboy Lim greeted the white woman who stood before him that morning at the check-in counter, holding a large green vinyl suitcase. She was sweating profusely, to his eyes grotesquely, in the apish manner of white people. Even their females were hairy. The woman before him, not nearly as slim-waisted as a Chinese, rested two forearms on a check-in counter. She was filling out the rest house registration card. Her limbs were blocked with wispy golden hairs matted into tufts like seagrass. He did a quick survey. She was alone, so she probably wasn't in Kuala Tringano simply for tourism. She had no tan. That meant either that she had just arrived in Malaysia or that she wasn't here to lounge around topless on the beach all day. He peeked down, pretending to check the number of bags she carried. Her clean seven legs revealed her to be American. American, he asked, accepting her registration card. Yes, she said, rifling through her cloth purse. There's a passport in here somewhere, though I don't really see what the point of it is. Everyone seems to know I'm American anyway. She stopped rifling and looked up at him. A Chinese cowboy. She resisted the temptation to laugh. It's like I have American tattooed on me, she said. Are you really such an expert on accents? Or do I have this look that says I'm trying to make a good impression so you won't hate me? No, he said absently, it's just guess. He pressed down on his hat, securing it firmly, frowning much too long at the registration card she had just filled out. The gestures suggested to the woman that he might be lying, as well as condemning himself for the lie. The act of placing hand to head was perhaps more psychologically revealing than most people realized. Lies were a form of assault, and like all assaults, they anticipated counterstrikes. If a lie had left his mouth, then his hand was unconsciously securing protection for the most vulnerable part of his body. His apparent fascination with her registration card was equally suspect. When one lied, the gaze of the victim was the most terrible punishment of all, since one was then either forced to reinforce the original lie by gazing back, assured and unblinking, or to acknowledge one's shame by avoiding the victim's gaze altogether. His actions suggested the latter. At any rate, his apparent shame canceled his apparent lie, if indeed he had lied. She decided to forgive whatever his trespass might have been. On the other hand, she had just ridden all night in a rattling bus, suffered the leering of hoodlums at the bus station, been talked at by that manly person, and climbed a steep flight of stairs with a 40-pound vinyl suitcase in her hand. She amended. Forgiveness was granted, but if this Chinese man in a cowboy hat stood there too much longer frowning at her registration card, he would be guilty, unconscionably so, of exploiting her sense of personal largesse. Passport, he said sternly. Oh, she said. She opened her purse. You know, I'm still curious how you knew I was American. I only ask because I have this theory that Americans try too hard to make everyone like them. All these little ambassadors running around making nice. She lifted her purse to the light and rummaged with both hands. It's kind of a preemptive strike, isn't it, she said, trying to make people like you in preparation for smearing their names at the bar. 
Actually, it's a little frightening. At least the Germans have the honesty to just come out and be obnoxious. Though I have to say, when I was in the Philippines, the German tourists were a little too honest. They seemed to be saying, I didn't hide my club, so be a good child and let me have a whack at you. Well, there it is. She pulled out the passport and shook it a few times. There, she said. I was in the Philippines for two years. You can see the stamp on the passport. Philippines. She held her passport up to him for inspection. The less secure the country, the bigger the stamp. I say get rid of the stamps and just have everyone sign a card promising decency under threat of death. That's a lovely hat, by the way. I don't believe I've seen a Stetson in Malaysia. He didn't seem to be listening. He wrote down the passport number, then surprised her by tipping his hat in acknowledgement of the compliment. How long do you stay, he said. I'm not really sure to tell you the truth. I'm going out soon to Badong Island where the refugee camp is. I don't know when. There's a Mr. Manley who's going to bring my papers tonight or tomorrow. He says he knows you. Manley, yes, he said. Sign, please. He tapped the check-in ledger. Nephew Yap, quietly folding towels, looked up quizzically. Manley, Cowboy Lim said, speaking to the boy. Teacher who need teaching. Ah, Mr. Manley, said Nephew Yap. He looked at pork pie with what seemed to her to be concern. Cowboy Lim watched her sign in. He began laughing. What's funny, she said. Your name, Bobby Pork Pie Sortini. Bobby mean pork in Malay. Same sound, yes? Bobby, Bobby. Your name, Pork Pork Sortini. Very funny. I see, she said evenly. There was the possibility of aggression in the man's comment. I'm not sure if you're laughing in a sexual connotation or the fact that this is a Muslim country. It is okay to say the word Muslim out loud here, isn't it? There isn't going to be some sudden hush in the room, is there? She looked over at Nephew Yap, obscured by a teetering pile of towels, searching his face for signs of discomfort. I'm not Muslim, said Cowboy Lim. I am Cowboy Lim, Chinese John Wayne. Not Buddhist, not Christian, free thinker. He wrapped the side of his head several times with a forefinger. Good for you, Mr. Cowboy, she said. Now, as a free thinker, you must realize that only the idiosyncratic has meaning. Bobby Pork Pie was the name given me by my mother. I go by Pork Pie. It's as natural to me as your apparent nom de l'hotel is to you. I don't mean to be petty, Mr. Cowboy, but when you laugh at my name, you diminish the flesh and blood behind it, and this flesh and blood is a very tired traveler who has just spent the last 12 hours in the overnight from Singapore. How would you feel if you'd been riding your little Chinese pony around all day and then heard someone laugh in your face because you were a Mr. Cowboy? There was silence for a moment. Then Cowboy Lim's face signaled mirth. A lopsided grin, one eye gone droopy, head cocked to the side, as if felled by a stroke. No offense, ma'am, he said pleasantly. Nine dollar, please. So she had misread him. Graciousness demanded her immediate surrender. Pork, pork, she said, counting out the bills and handing them over. Oh, yes, I see the humor now. I'm just exhausted, that's all. He handed her a receipt, which she made a point of taking without reading. Really, she said brightly, it's funny. Cowboy Lim nodded. She wanted so much to demonstrate her sincerity that she found herself convinced by her own words. Why, the joke was funny, outrageously clever even. She would have to relate it in a letter to someone. Perhaps dear Esmeralda in Manila would enjoy it, or Teresa in Bataan. <coughs> perhaps, why yes, <coughs> perhaps even Lyle back in Chicago, though an attempt at communication would require ignoring why she divorced him in the first place. And then there would be that messy business of mentally relocating him from hell where she had assigned him to rot for a thousand years. He had hardly done his time. Only two years served, and already his image seemed accommodating enough, enough for less sanguine fantasies. Perhaps she could relocate him temporarily, just to see how he fit in to a different lobe, just behind the ears, bordering, bordering purgatory, but well above eternal damnation. It was exciting to contemplate. Perhaps two years in the Peace Corps had been better therapy than graduate school, after all. Have a nice day, ma'am, Cowboy Lim drawled, tipping his hat. He smiled. Thank you, she said, and smiled back. She picked up the enormous suitcase at her feet. Nephew Yap took the room key and jangled it in front of him, indicating that she should follow. She did, wheeling herself and her bag up the stairs, summoning reserves of strength she didn't know she still possessed. The boy hadn't offered to carry her luggage. She was so tired, she found his lapse of etiquette, etiquette hilarious. How odd, she thought, that one's physical state should influence one's frame of mind so much. How odd that this dank, dark place should suddenly seem so welcoming. 
If Cowboy Limbs was anything like the small Chinese hotels in the Philippines, the night would be filled with flimmy gurgling and short, muffled shrieks. In the morning, there would be the clop of wet sandals in the hallway, bare light bulbs glaring overhead, a chorus of bodily purgations splatting down holes or onto the washroom floor. She paused, panting slightly, on the second floor landing. Her escort looked around the corner as if checking for thieves. The rest house reeked of poverty. Out the window, she saw wet undergarments hanging from the courtyard balconies. There were dark stains on the wall, a radio blaring Hindi music somewhere, doors slamming across the courtyard. A fat man down the hall looked at her with undisguised interest. Her skin held forth the possibility of miscegenation. But that was what made Asia so attractive, did it not? There was a charge of electricity in the air, even in the midst of stupefying boredom. One's life could change in a moment. The room set her into a brief fit of laughter. Stained gray linoleum, dull green walls, a dusty ceiling fan, a four poster bed so big she would have to walk sideways to get to her the bathroom. Torn green drapes covered a row of windows. In one corner was a small wooden writing table, discolored with watermarks. In another was a silver spittoon and a green plastic wastebasket side by side. The sight was marvelous, the very picture of failed, earnest practicality, charming in its seediness and lack of imagination. That mark on the wall there, said Pork Pie, dropping her bag on the bed, is that really an arrow pointed toward Mecca for prayers? It was. Priceless, it really is. Are there Christian rooms with an arrow pointing straight up? I suppose a Buddhist arrow would always have to be right in front of you wherever you looked. Mr. Cowboy might like one that turns into a question mark, but only if you touch it, of course, matter being supreme. The boy stood blinking in front of her, his lips parted and closed, fish-like, as if attempting to speak. Oh, look what I've done now, Pork Pie said. You poor thing. That's one thing you might as well know about me. I'm not one of those tourists who goes gaga at the local standards. There's nothing holy about the way you do things here. Come to America someday, and you'll see there's nothing holy about my home either. Yes, the boy said softly and began to walk backward toward the door. He stopped to flick the light switch off and on, nodding his head at Pork Pie. I'm sure the lights work fine, said Pork Pie, crossing her arms. It's a beautiful room. I couldn't be happier. Thank you. The boy grasped the doorknob and closed the door slowly. The last Pork Pie saw of him was his hand in the hallway, waving by. She sighed, sitting heavily on the bed. The mattress was hard. She lifted up a corner and saw the plywood board lying between mattress and box spring. The board had been stamped with a notice of ownership in red letters, Property of Cowboy Lim Rest House. The sight made her smile. Where else in the world would you find a property of stamp on a plywood bedboard? It was all so silly and so crass you had to smile. Sitting in this impoverished room, lying on a mattress, exploring, you had the feeling you were a child playing inside a cardboard box. The filthy dark corners suggested mystery. The walls were deliciously rough and discolored, irresistible to the touch. The air was stale and faintly lurid, faintly tragic. It was the whole world reduced to a room-sized square right in front of you, and if your heart didn't beat faster in it, you might as well be reading excruciatingly intelligent books with someone like Lyle at your side, shilly-shallying your life away. There was still so much to do. She zipped open her bag and took out clothes. Sundresses on the hangers, formal occasion stockings inside the underwear, then pumps and sandals under the bed. Overhead, a pair of amorous geckos humped in mechanical rapture on the ceiling. A moth beat itself against the fluorescent light. She paused, shaking her suitcase hand, massaging it with her other hand. From the bottom of the bag, she withdrew small objects, a sheathed aborigine knife smuggled past customs, a child's handloom of Filipino origin made from discarded combs, a dictionary of Latin phrases, and something she had purchased for a ring in a Malay restaurant, a mud wasp's nest the size of her palm, preserved in shellac and stuffed, the waiter said, with paraffin. It is a delightful collection, she thought, dilettantish in theme, sexually charged, perhaps even a bit hostile intellectually. The loom and wasp nest she put on top of the dictionary, setting them on the writing table. The knife she placed on the floor within reaching distance. A woman alone didn't have to be stupid about exploration, no matter what the appeal of danger. She rose and sidled her way to the bathroom to wash her face. Outside, a clanging noise was rising above the diesel and motorcycle traffic. It echoed against the bathroom tile as in a, sh as in a sound chamber. How long had the noise been there? 
There was simply too much demanding her attention. Sleep was called for. Sleep and only sleep. She filled the plastic bucket with water from the square water cistern and poured it over her head, giving herself over for a long, luxurious moment to the pleasures of the bucket bath, the baptismal whoosh, the loss of sight and sound, the idle speculation that the world outside has ceased to exist. Then there was that clanging noise again, like cymbals in an orchestra. She paused. It was insistent. There would be no sleep until she knew. She placed the bucket back into the cistern and held her sarong against her like a blanket. Her feet squeaked against the linoleum, trilling water. At the window, she pulled aside the drapes and saw them. Chinese mourners wearing white sackcloth, trailing a funeral wagon. At the front of the line were two men clanging small gongs. She cranked the window latch, watching the glass frames open like a door. The moist hot air poured in. But there was something else as well. She had to step back. There were starlings, hundreds of them, shrieking and wheeling overhead. The gongs below, clang, 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 were driving them crazy. How could she not have seen the birds before? Why, the sky was filled with starlings, and she hadn't noticed. She cupped her hand like a visor over her eyes and looked out. It was such a contradiction. Birds above, a funeral below. Poetry. She wiped her nose on her sarong and looked at the reflection in the window. The ghostly figure was hers. She did not immediately recognize her face, though she knew it could be no one else's. Her mouth was slack, her expression distant. Her hair lay slick, I'm sorry, her hair lay in slick blades, in, in slick braids against her shoulders, and she was pressing so tightly against the latch she could see her fingers quiver. She loosened her grasp. Her body was trembling. Holding the window just so, half open, she saw the small pulse on her wrist rise and fall. Her eyes gleamed in the angle of light like a cat's, and she could feel her breath come rapid and shallow. She hurt herself. She was giggling. Hysteria, she thought. I must watch that. It was degrading. It revealed one as girlish and naive, so utterly, utterly to be avoided. The day had altogether been too much. She nodded the sarong above her breast and stepped back, collapsing on the bed. The mattress was hard as earth. The clanging came in through the window. The overhead fan hacked at the air. Down the hall, somebody was spitting. Despite everything, was this not more lovely than life with Lyle? Had the Peace Corps not been more lovely as well? She closed her eyes, recalling the bus ride up from Singapore, roaring around the blind curves. Sitting upright in her seat, watching the trucks come barreling the other way, imagining collision, she had summoned forth his image and found him merely pathetic. Such a change from the loathsome creature she'd imagined a scant two years back in Chicago. Such a change even from rural Luzon, where she was able to summon but a single image of her former husband. Quiet, bookish Lyle in the backyard, wearing swim trunks and tennis shoes. He hadn't known she was watching. He was mowing the grass. His face was contorted in a way she had never seen. He mowed the entire backyard, row by row, a half hour in the sun, screaming obscenities under the roar of the mower. And in the span of a single afternoon, she knew she could not live side by side with his secrets. No, he did not deserve a thousand years in hell. She would drop him a civil note. She would write her friends back in the Philippines. She would tell everyone about Kuala Tringano, and then she would tell them about Bedong Island. I'm on my way home, she would say, via a refugee camp. How fitting. She slept. Just like that, the world fell black, the air silent. Her mind filled with a delicious dream, full and bursting with the Chicago wind, the view of Lake Michigan, the rattling of the L. She smelled lilacs. She was eating a bratwurst, munching then holding out like a torch, high and triumphant. The dream was so delicious, she did not want to stir when the knocking started at the door. She rose. It was Mr. Cowboy. He had a note for Mr. Manley. She took it dumbly, peering from behind the door, mindful of her sarong and wet hair. She remembered too late to thank Mr. Cowboy for bringing up the message from Manley. Wait, she said softly, but he was already trotting down the stairs. She read the note, then crumpled it into a ball. She walked to the bed and lay down, her eyes open and blinking. A party tonight, she thought. She needed the party tonight like she needed another night on the bus. Would no one just let her sleep? 
for the second section, uh, <coughs> I'd like to read a, a chapter that introduces uh, the Malaysian bureaucrat, an Indian Sikh named Gurmit. Uh, he is new to the island of Badong. He's the only Sikh there. And he feels a little out of sorts because he is surrounded by Westerners and by Malays. And no one, no one, no one talks to him and no one seems to respect him. He's the uh, administrative chief. Gurmit Singh was given a small plywood office built on stilts to rise above the monsoon mud. The floor slats had been hurriedly pounded together, and in the gaps he saw the inquisitive, upturned faces of open-mouthed Vietnamese children. When he moved, the faces moved with him. They yammered loudly to the mothers and fathers lounging in their burlap shelters, reporting the dramas unfolding inches above them. From his first week, lines of Vietnamese petitioners, accompanied by self-appointed translators, quietly jammed the steps in the early morning and filed in. He was exhausted. The refugees wore him down with pleading. They softened him with weeping. They enticed him with lascivious bribes. They wanted interviews with Western delegations for resettlement. They wanted cooking pots in Zone C, running shorts in Zone F. They wanted Mr. Huang removed as Vietnamese chief of Zone A. Later in the morning, the white relief workers would knife through the crowd of petitioners outside his door. Howdy, they would say, and when they did, the children under the floorboards would begin to chatter excitedly. The white people would stand, circling like tigers, or drop with a thud onto the low bench in front of the desk. They told him they weren't there to tell him his job, and they made sure he understood this point by thumping their index fingers on the desktop and staring him straight in the eye. They demanded more rations for the refugees, more plastic tarp, more extensive responsibilities, better lines of communication. They warned that they didn't give a hooey who was running the show, that Task Force Chief Ahmad Budinsky, or whatever his name was, better keep his paws off Miss Dong or Yong or Jung. They weren't sure how to pronounce it. In the afternoons, the Malay Task Force police sauntered in, clothed in sarongs, sometimes with ancient carbines slung across their shoulders. They queried him for information on thieving Chinese tongs and psychotic ex arvin ranger scouts and troublemaking white bastards. They frowned at his decision to provide lumber for Zone A, while Zone B still needed a supply depot. They derided him for cleaning out the processed chicken in Zone F to give to the new arrivals in Zone C. In the early morning, just as the sky exploded with color and the beaches filled with loungers, he would hunch over the wireless to report to the mainland officials. They spoke sharply into his earpiece. Where are the tuberculosis clearance sheets for the Canadian group, La? Why haven't you transferred the burn case to the Kuala Trigano Hospital, La? Why aren't the cabbage baskets on the supply boat, La? Who are you to give a camp pass to the Swedish whore journalist, La? By dinner, his mind blistered with doubt and worry. He had too much to do, and he made too many mistakes. The Vietnamese manipulated him. The police looked down on him. The whites walked over him. The UN officials berated him. He was alone. And then he would rise from his desk and throw down a candy sweet to the children gathered under the floor, shuffling the candy over to a gap with a sandal. Opening the door, he would find himself surrounded by petitioners. A great cry would go up, and refugees would thrust documents in his face. Later, he would say, waving them away, I'll get to you all, I promise. He would walk past the police barracks and shout hello to the sleepy-eyed Malays. And then he would walk on the main footpath and shout hello to the sullen Vietnamese hunkered in their burlap and plastic huts. As he walked, he thought of food, but he could not eat with the Malay task force police, for he reported to the UN and Malaysian Red Crescent officials on the mainland, not to the Malaysian prison systems. And he could not eat with refugees, because they had barely enough to feed themselves. So he would walk down to the staff eating hut, where the white people ate meals at a, at a huge wooden table covered with a red and white checkered plastic tablecloth. Hello, Gurmit, they would say. How's the paper pusher today? He would smile and attempt to follow the rapid-fire jokes. He would tell them his problems, and they would nod and press him for details about the police and the Vietnamese, then pat his back and tell him he should get out of the office more because he was in a refugee camp, for crying out loud, and the real work, the satisfying stuff, was out among the Viets, not cooped up in that hot box he called an office. The teachers related how Mr. Nyuk, a star intermediate English student, had distracted a guard while they sneaked into the task force storehouse to steal notebooks for their classes. The engineers talked about leading lightning raids with their Vietnamese camp generator team deep into the UN speedboat depot. Oil barrel spotted, oil barrel requisitioned, oil barrel in use. The social workers 
revealed that they had just that day orchestrated the heist of canned milk for their weaning mothers in Zone F from the black market in Zone C. The stories made Germit weak. Why couldn't they wait? He had just arrived in the island. He could make things work, if only he were given the time. He issued feeble protest and was met with withering glares. One day they lectured him in terrifying, unfamiliar tones. Do you think this is about paperwork? There are people out there in need. We have what they need. We need to get it to them. We need to do it now. Germit listened politely. He told them he understood, but that, they, but that they must think of the future. They must consider the long-term effects. Establish order first. Go slow and steady. For if they didn't mind his telling them so, Task Force and Dr. Johansson and Kuala Tringanu, and even the director of UNV and the sub-officers of UNHCR, thought the camp staff too, well, yes, he would say it, too independent. That's very Asian, said the teacher. The social worker pointed out that Orientals had a much different sense of time than they were used to. The engineer asked if Kronos were a Hindu god or just Greek. I am a Sikh, said Germit. I am not Hindu. So where is your turban, asked the engineer. Bull, said the teacher. Sikhs don't wear turbans. I thought they carried knives, said the social worker. She asked Germit if he carried a knife. Her face was furrowed with worry. Bloody hell, thought Germit. He plucked his fork off his, I'm sorry, he plucked his fork off his plate and brandished it like a stiletto, waving it in the air. He decided to keep his problems to himself. After dinner, he often returned to his office to complete refugee arrival forms. He found solace in the deserted office after the refugees had to leave the administrative compound. A fluorescent tube burned over his head and geckos slithered out from the wall slats to feast on mosquitoes and moths. He would lean back listening to Vietnamese music screeching from the loudspeakers. Relax, he thought. Concentrate on the task at hand. Despair is for cowards. For assurance, he would stare at the glossy sheet above the door jamb where he had hammered an advertisement from an India Today magazine. The caption at the bottom read, Captain knows best. We sail, you rest. Above it was a color photo of a human V wedge. Men and women arranged like migrating birds. At the ends were black cooks in starched high hats and beaming brown stewards. In the middle danced a conga line of busty white women with golden hair that fell on their shoulders like shocks of wheat. Their arms were wrapped around Teutonic men in crossed, in, I'm sorry, increased tropical shirts. At the front where he belonged stood a strapping, crop-haired Sikh in naval attire. The picture invigorated Germany. The island inhabitants were not yet that disciplined V-wedge. The refugees were not yet those casual, secure travelers. The staff was not yet those steady, contented workers. And he was not yet that strapping, crop-haired Sikh captain. But he would be. In his heart, he knew he would. He would be the invisible hand steering the course. He would be the righteous leader. In preparation for that day, he had placed a dignified white and black naval hat in his bottom desk drawer. When that day came, when order reigned, he would take the hat from his drawer place it on his head and parade around the camp. He would wear it to lunch. He would wear it on the dock when he stood to greet the UN delegations. The Malays and the refugees would not think it odd. They would envy his dry head during the monsoons. The white people would laugh at first, but the fact that he wore the cap would be in their minds. Soon a group of whites would smile hugely when Germit, still in his cap, walked past the staff bungalows. Germit up here, one would say, and Germit would stride up the steps. A bottle of Johnny Walker, black label, would appear, and one of the men would pour him a glass with a great show of steel, over-dramatizing the danger that the task force police, Muslims all, would enforce the silly no liquor rule. The palaver would start. First, his host would yell down to a favorite refugee across the wire fence, an English speaker, probably some ravaged ex-bar girl with bad teeth. Keep an eye out for the police, his host would say to the girl. We're having a snort. And the girl would smile and yell back, Okay, Mr. Bob, or Mr. Ralph, or Mr. Manley, it really made little difference who spoke, as long as the face was white. And having smiled and waved theatrically, the girl would make a grand show of carrying out her duties and bark out commands to a dozen nephews and sisters who would fan out like miniature snipers, keeping low, in the shadows, in full sight of the white man, and watch for some passing sarong-clad Malay policeman on his, way to the Malay, um, on his way to the police bathing well. The white man would watch until his sentries were in position, and the play would draw to its final scene. 
The white man would wink to the girl, and the girl would giggle. He would pause, look out at the sky, then focus on Germit and raise his glass. Their glasses would meet and clink. The white man would raise an imaginary hat with his free hand and say, Cheers, Captain. When that moment came, Germit knew, all the white people would soon call him Captain, for the white people spoke with one voice. In a few more days, the Malay police would also call him Captain, for the Malays feared the language of the white bastards and made up their own whenever they could. And then the Vietnamese would call him Captain, for the white people in the Malays spoke the language of power. All would call him Captain, for that is what he would be. All would see that he had brought order. All would see the camp running well, the supplies in place, the rations increased, the delegations whisking in and whisking out, the hospital finished, another school at Zone B. They would eat together, Malays and whites. The concertina wire would be torn from the police and staff compounds and shipped to the mainland. And the refugees would squat contentedly in their huts, awaiting their orderly procession onto the idling UN boats where they would sit in comfort and look out over the ocean, drawing ever closer to places where they would not disappear, name and body and life. Thanks.